Hey everyone, Chat Cemetery is back, as is Drew Deach. We're talking all about Silver Bullet today, which is a movie from 1985 that is based off of the novella Cycle of the Werewolf. We've already discussed that one, so we won't talk too much about it as far as you know the source material goes, but it is one of those adaptations here that does not take on the title of the source material, which happens numerous times throughout you know, the history of Stephen King adaptations. But Mm -hmm. Drew, are you ready to talk about Silver Bullet today? Oh, yeah. I mean, I I signed up for this episode for a couple of reasons. One, I love werewolves in general. They're one of my favorite movie monsters, and and there aren't enough really great werewolf movies. Um, This is a significant werewolf movie, but we can certainly talk about its, its quality. Also, I love Cycle of the Werewolf. It might be one of my favorite pieces of Stephen King literature ever, especially with the the beautiful Bernie Wrights and artwork. And I had not seen Silver Bullet since I was probably a kid. Like I caught it on television a couple okay. times. And this was probably the first time I saw it from beginning to end. And I was surprised to find that Silver Bullet, at least I, I would say in a skeletal structure, kind of resembles my all-time favorite movie, and that's Jaws. This is a a story about a small town that is being attacked by a creature, and at the end, three people have to band together to hunt it down and destroy it. I'm like, oh, well, that's Jaws. The movie doesn't quite capture that (laughs) as as it rolls on, but there there was some interesting trivia I was able to dig up about this. It was originally going to be directed by Don Coscarelli, who did Phantasm and Beastmaster and Bubba Hotep, like a really storied uh, independent horror director. Um, And this is, uh, I think it's appropriate because you and I also did the Cat's Eye episode, and that was also produced by Dino De Laurentiis and with a script by Stephen King, who also has the credit for the screenplay on Silver Bullet. Right. And I, I feel like this is another cat's eye situation where the movie's not bad but it's like three or four notches from being really good yeah when i went into this i was sort of expecting it to be almost along the lines of children of the corn so i'm very glad it wasn't that far in the Mm -hmm. bad direction but (laughs) no this was very you know middle of the road for me i believe i gave it a three out of five and if i'm not mistaken you did as well and Mm. it was the first time i had ever seen it this wasn't something i had seen before which is actually going to be the case with a lot of these older movies i want to say probably a lot through the 90s or just ones that i haven't seen for one reason or the other i've seen some of the big ones semi-recently like shawshank green mile Mm -hmm. so on and so forth but I was not super aware that this one even existed because Cycle of the Werewolf was something that wasn't in my mom's Stephen King collection. So when I was going through and getting ready for this podcast, I was like, what is this? Where is it? Why don't we have it? (laughs) And so it was a whole new experience for me with that, too. So I think based on, like you said, those beautiful illustrations, you kind of have this image in your head of what you would want this to look like. And this doesn't quite live up to that. But one of the other things that I always want to talk about when it comes to movies is the casting. And for me, only a few people were familiar to me in this. And the big two being Gary Busey and Terry O'Quinn with hair, which was very strange to see. And then, you know, you have Corey... Haim, Haim, I'm not really 100% sure on the pronunciation for his last name, but he plays Marty and unfortunately not someone who is still with us today. But those three names were the ones I was like, okay, you know, I've heard of these people. I've seen these people and things. Don't ask me necessarily what all I've seen them in, but they have been in lots of things. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a solid cast. I actually think the casting is one of the best elements of the movie. Yeah. Uh, Corey Haim and and Gary Busey as an uncle and nephew pairing, their relationship is so good in the movie. It's so fun. Yeah. Yeah. And and they take appropriate time in the first act setting up their relation. And and it doesn't take a whole lot of time, 
but it's very clear. Like we, we see them playing poker and, and Gary Busey's character, uncle red is he's, he's a drunkard and very lively and clearly loves Marty and kind of, you know, I don't want to say dotes on him, but he he really loves him and he wants him to be a full fledged young kid, even though he is, uh, you know, he has to utilize a wheelchair. So I I loved their relationship. I loved Busey and Haim playing off of each other and and pretty clearly improving at times. And and I love that. Like, I really think if not for that, the movie might sink completely but they elevate it so much yeah there is plenty of overacting to go around in parts of this movie but i don't think any of it really stems from the three actors that i mentioned i think terry o'quinn gives a very sort of grounded performance in this even though the town is going through something unexpected and he has absolutely no idea what to do about it because he's kind of in over his head in this small town it's like okay people keep dying every month and he's put in the position where it's him and what one other cop in the town Mm -hmm. yep and and i i gotta say i think terry o'quinn gets the best horror i'll say the best dramatic horror moment in the movie is when they find the body of a dead child and Mm -hmm. He's carrying uh, the kite that he was flying, which has a smiley face on it with blood. And he's walking away from the body and saying, Hail Mary, full of grace. And he's just so clearly, you know, in in shock. And the framing of that scene, how we never really see the body, but we see it at kind of a distance with just a little bit of light in this gazebo. I would say that's probably the one image in the movie that actually felt genuinely haunting. Yeah. Yeah. It might be the best moment in the movie, too, as far as just setting the tone and setting the scene Mm -hmm. and, you know, seeing that kite, you know, right away. And, you know, we've seen what the werewolf has done at this point. You know, we might as well go ahead and dive into the story here. And you see these brutal deaths, but with the kid if I'm not mistaken, we don't really see what happens. We see him flying the kite one moment, and then you get this brutal scene that just tells you everything you need to know about what happened without necessarily having to live through it. Oh, it's, it's, it's great. It's, it's smart editing because we hear, uh, you know, his father saying like, has anybody seen my boy? And then it is a hard cut to that, that kite covered in blood. And yeah, and it's like, oh, wow, that's that's perfect. And then just, again, the 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 framing of the body in the distance where we can see the kind of the shape of a corpse, but we can't really make out anything of it. And we never get any kind of close up. I was like, this is this gets the closest to me to replicating the mood of the Bernie Wrights and artwork from the the original novella right and you know talking about like the the werewolf he, we have like he attacks a woman who is discovered that she's pregnant and that the the father is not going to have any of it so she decides to kill herself and then the werewolf bursts in and takes care of it for her which if i remember is what happens in the novella um and i i'll give this movie this there as far as uh gore effects there's some pretty effective stuff i mean the first kill in the movie is some guy on the railroads who gets decapitated and there's like a couple shots of just his head on the train tracks i'm like that's that's nasty yeah some of the practical effects work really well in this while at other times you're kind of like eh, that one didn't really land so well and i think it's hard with a movie like this because now if they were to do this movie The werewolf would more than likely just totally be CGI, and you can't really do that in this without, you know, really, really dating the movie. So I think they work as well as they can with what they're given. And this is another one of those movies that wasn't super high budget. Oh, by no means. And and I I think obviously a lot of the budget went into uh, Carlo Rambaldi, who also did the the troll monster in Cat's Eye appropriately. Um making the werewolf and i mean we just got to talk about the werewolf in the room the 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 design of the werewolf 
is not great. No. <laughs> it looks like Alf from the show Alf. Um, <laughs> like Morphed weird... into a werewolf. <laughs> yeah, it looks like werewolf Alf. Like he's got this weird, very stubby nose. Like it's it's more dog-like than wolf-like, unfortunately. And, you know, the, the there are plenty of great practical werewolves throughout cinema um both in the past and recently like uh, the the Benicio del Toro Wolfman isn't a great movie but the actual design and the practical makeup done on him is great and obviously American Werewolf in London even movies like Bad Moon Bad Moon has a fantastic practical werewolf so it it wasn't out of the realm of possibility to make a good looking werewolf in this but I just think the entire face and snout and everything it's it just doesn't it just doesn't work but i will say that there are some good ideas in how to utilize the werewolf the kind of signature scene in the movie is when all the townsfolk decide to band together to go hunting for whoever it is doing this killing and they get out into this fog bank and the werewolf is underneath the fog and taking them out and that concept is such a winner. It's it's not executed the best, but I I like it in concept and I like the kind of striking image of one of the townsfolk played by Lawrence Tierney has a baseball bat that has the words the peacemaker written on it. And yeah. the werewolf takes the bat from him and he's beating him to death and it's just the werewolf hand with the bat coming in and out of frame. And I'm like that's a ridiculous image, but I guarantee you I'm going to remember it. Right. It's something that you can tell probably had a little bit to do with the budget. It's like, no, we're just going to show an arm and a bat because yep. <laughs> we don't really want to do this again. <laughs> and, you know, I think during the movie, one of the things I noticed was that you feel bad for some of the victims, but not all of them. You know, there are some who definitely are just grade A scumbags and you aren't going to miss them. But then when you have something like the kid out flying the kite, sure, he's not the nicest kid probably, but he's still a kid. You know, there's still time hmm. for him to get better and you oh, know, sure. change. And you have these moments where it's like, okay, you know, you feel bad for a certain kind of victim. But then when someone is just like super angry and, you know, basically thinks Marty should die. It's like, yep, no, we're not going to feel bad about him. <laughs> no, not at all. And and I think uh, revisiting this, I, I remembered only kind of what I had pieced together from the novella, which I've read a lot more. And I think one of the biggest problems of Silver Bullet is not just the werewolf in design, but the person who is turning into the werewolf. Mm -hmm. And that's that's Reverend Lowe, played by the the wonderful Everett McGill, who people probably know from stuff like Twin Peaks, uh, People Under the Stairs, which is a great movie. And the movie, I I don't think the movie needed to string out the mystery of who the werewolf was. That's not what it it's really about. But I feel that Reverend Lowe kind of ceases to be a character after a certain point, And he is just a kind of placeholder villain of sorts like he he has a very interesting debate going on inside of him which is that he knows he's a werewolf but he can't kill himself because that's against his religion and that's a great piece of conflict to put on this character and he also gets the the wackiest uh kind of conceptual piece in the movie in which he has a dream uh, where he's at a funeral speaking and then the entire congregation turns into werewolves, which, <laughs> which no matter what, uh, if, if I remembered anything from this movie as a kid, it was that scene. Yeah. I think too, with the Reverend, he just turned so creepy so quickly. It was like, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. You know, he is really creeping on Jane here <laughs> and you just kind of felt gross watching it in a way and it's like okay yeah you know you don't really have too many strong female characters in this to begin with and I think Jane could have been one of those characters that you know had this triumph and in a sense she still does but I think because of the little story between her and the reverend it's just like 
yeah, no, I feel a little gross now, so let's just get Jane away from this. <laughs> yeah, there's this movie makes a lot of I, I have to believe that it's script issues and, you know, the only credited writer is Stephen King, but I don't know what got changed in post-production or, or was mandated by somebody like De Laurentiis because uh, t- talking about the Reverend, this happens so much in movies where as soon as the audience or even the characters in the the story find out that uh, a supposed good person is evil, all of a sudden that person turns completely arch. Like they are just, it's like, whoa, you're not even acting like the same character you were before. Now, all of a sudden you're very mincing and, you know, every line is dripping with creepiness. And that, that happens to Reverend Lowe here. As soon as the audience discovers that he is the bad guy, nothing he's doing is played. So he's playing it like he knows he's the villain and, and relishing it. And in regards to Jane, my biggest problem with Jane is that the movie starts and ends and I think sometimes in between very randomly uh, has a bit of voiceover from a grown up Jane. Yes, I thought that was weird, too. I was like, wait, why is there narration going on all of a sudden? (laughs) Because you'd go so long without it. And then she just pops in again. And I'm like, oh, okay. so this is being told from Jane's perspective, even though Jane wasn't in like 90 percent of the scenes or right. would have any memory of it. It would have made much more sense to come from Marty's perspective because mm-hmm. he was the one who was actually present for everything. And I will admit, though, I am impressed with how well Marty can sneak around yeah. <laughs> given that he can't use his legs to their full extent, obviously, no. because he's paralyzed. You know, He's crawling out his bedroom window on the second story climbing down, getting to his <laughs> fancy silver bullet bike that his uncle made him. And it's like you could tell they were like, okay, kid, don't use your legs. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. The, the, I'm, I'm sure the, the, the rehearsals for that were quite fun for Corey Haim trying to learn not to use his legs for things. But, but you're right. Like The movie in the first act frames the story as this story is going to be about Marty and Jane and how they – just really didn't get along as siblings, but then this traumatic event that happened in their town brought them closer together. And technically, yes, that does happen in the movie, but with the addition of of, J- of a grown-up Jane's voiceover in the beginning, it really feels like, well, you either need to try and focus this story from Jane's perspective or Jane when she's with Marty, but the movie doesn't really have a perspective and in in a way I think it kind of gets shaky about even having a clear-cut protagonist like we would say the protagonist is Marty but there's times when the movie kind of switches focus to Uncle Red and then he kind of becomes a protagonist of sorts there's times when it switches to Jane or then all of a sudden it's in uh, Reverend Lowe's perspective. Um, I, I would have liked the movie, I think, a little bit more if it kind of picked one perspective lane and stuck to it, because then maybe we are finding out about things about the werewolf along with Marty and Jane instead of being two steps ahead of the characters at every turn. Yeah, it's like they just piece together all of these different perspectives as if. Jane was remembering it based on what she was told from these other characters, but you would assume that the Reverend wouldn't have told her anything. So then you're like, eh, but that doesn't really work out. And, you know, I think they did get the tone of the small town where everyone knows everyone down Mm -hmm. pretty well. Oh, yeah. Because you can tell that's something that just oozes throughout the story. You get these shots of, you know, oh, hey, Mr. So-and-so, I'm here to collect bottles. And that is a very lengthy moment, but we understand why Jane is going around doing that. It's clever. I I liked that. Like, I liked that as a way into how would they try and figure out who's going to be having an eye injury. I'm like, it. yeah, (laughs) and it, it does have that small town flavor that like Stephen King can just make up small towns, you know, in an afternoon and make them feel believable and lived in and and i i have to say tarker's tarker's mills is is 
is another success. Like, I feel like, yeah, I buy that as a real town. Plus the fact that you can really fall in love with some of the towns that he creates. I don't know if I necessarily felt that way with this one, but, Mm -hmm. you know, anyone who has read multiple Stephen King books or watched multiple Stephen King adaptations is probably at least familiar with, I would say, Castle Rock and Derry. Yes. Because those are the two where you're like, you know what? I really have a connection to these towns after reading so many of these stories. And, you know, I have yet to read it, but I'm sure it'll just make me love Derry even more. Oh, that is like the the haha king of small towns because you just learn so much about the history. So much of the book is about the history of the town. And yeah. And Cycle of the Werewolf, like I said, it it captures that or it attempts to capture that Jaws feeling of Amity Island. Like, okay, I understand how this community works, what its, you know, key members are, what their kind of roles are, not just in in what their jobs are, but what kind of their emotional roles are in the town's hierarchy. And and it works well enough, like it's functional. I don't I don't think it ever crosses over into being really lovable or kind of crystalline, but it's functional. It gets the job done. Yeah, absolutely. Well, is there anything else about the story in particular you want to touch on? I know this isn't going to be one of our longer episodes, but I feel like, (laughs) you know, because of the format of the story, it's almost like Batman the Long Halloween. Right. No, that's a great uh, reference point. And I love that story. But in this, because you don't necessarily get to see it the same way you do with the novella. It was something that fell a little flat for me. I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. you know, they have to be putting together that these are happening at a specific time every month. And that never really fully comes to fruition, except for with Marty. Yeah, I I think there's two factors that that hinder that. One, the director, Daniel Atias, um, who has gone on to become kind of one of the most in-demand journeyman TV directors out there. This is his only feature credit. Uh, So, you know, I think that kind of tells you something like, I don't, I don't think this was the movie that a first timer really needed to helm. I think it needed somebody with a little bit stronger vision. Uh, And so there isn't really a structure in place that gets that kind of timeline going. I, I don't, I don't know if the movie needed to be, as sectioned out as to have, you know, intertitles that say, you know, May, June or whatever, like like it does in the novella. But I, I agree the sense of time is so loose that it feels like this is supposed to take place over months. And I'm like, it feels like it takes place in like a week. Yeah. So I think there's there was a disconnect there with the timeline. Absolutely. And the other thing is they introduce and I, again, I, I haven't read the novella in a few years, so I don't remember if this is touched upon, but they mention that they theorize that the werewolf is always like this. It's just the closer the full moon gets, the less he can kind of control it. So he can kind of transform any time, um, yeah. which I'm like, uh, I don't know. That's, 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 that's a really. good shaky <laughs> excuse, but <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm. I'm with you on that. Like, I I don't think that there's a good flow to the story. If anything, it feels very quick, like rushed. Um, not not that I wanted, not that I wanted like twenty twenty five minutes more of this particular version of the story. Mm-hmm. But it's like, yeah, I think you kind of needed to flesh out the time in between and maybe make the Reverend a little bit more of a conflicted figure and. Give us even more time with Marty and Jane's relationship. Um, Because like I said, Marty and Uncle Red's relationship works like gangbusters. And I love how incredulous uh, Uncle Red is at times. I'll say that. I think the few attempts at humor in the movie are pretty good. Yeah. There's, There's the whole bit where they're talking about, okay, we know the Reverend's the werewolf. And Gary Busey says... This isn't Hardy Boys versus Reverend Werewolf, and and that's fun. And then there's an outright, like, 
three stooges gag when the the posse is hunting the werewolf and one of the guys gets his leg caught in a bear trap yeah. and the guy's trying to open it and then somebody shouts hey and then he closes it on his leg again <laughs> yeah. i was like this is this is out of a whole different movie but i'm kind of enjoying it yeah there were some fun moments like that in there and i know we touched a little on the visuals already but i want to dive into a more specific moment that stood mm. out to me and that's when the reverend is at the service you know he's at the head of the service that's going on and then everyone in the room starts turning into a werewolf and it ends up being a dream which isn't surprising at all but you can tell that there's this guilt inside of him but i feel like you know because they never really took the time to make him that much of a likable character in the first place he was kind of just in the background until yeah. Jane starts going around and trying to figure out who is missing an eye, basically. But that moment in the dream sequence, I was like, you know what? These werewolves might not look the best, but I think, you know, maybe they spent a lot of the budget on that scene. <laughs> oh, I'm certain. I mean, they, they, because every person who's turning into a werewolf has kind of different stages of transformation. So that's all different kinds of makeups and contact lenses and prosthetics that they have to make. And um, it's, it's a demented wackadoo scene. And, yeah. and this is another thing I think that the movie needs is, is a better control of tone because like I said, like the few moments of comedy feel so heightened that they feel like they're out of another movie. This sequence is the one that gets the closest. I mean, this is a, I think like a whole chapter in the novella where the Reverend has this dream and it's clear that this is the scene that I think they knew they wanted to make from the book. They were like, this is kind of the highlight. Nobody has ever done this scene before uh, peace. And yeah, while, while the execution isn't great, the, the concept is fun. I love when they cut back to the church organist who is just slamming on the, the organ keys yeah. as a werewolf. I'm like, this is nutty. and But I think with better direction and better lighting, so much of this movie is just so flat and, and lighting. Um, and I think that's one of its biggest issues is that it never comes alive too much. Uh, in the lighting, there's no real dynamic lighting to make even a dream sequence where you could be as surreal as you wanted to. It doesn't have enough color or pop to it. Yeah, it felt like it had a very mundane tone to it. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, here's this small town where nothing really happens. And then we're going to have this big thing happen and it'll still look like a mundane small town. <laughs> yeah, which is why I call back to that scene of, of finding... Uh, the dead boy because I'm like wow this is the one little bit that has kind of an understanding of color and and how that can impact the image and the mood of what you're seeing and if the movie had a little bit more of that which it has plenty of opportunities to like there's a point where Marty because they they cancel the fourth of July you know celebration because of these murders and Uncle Red gets him some fireworks and he has a great line where he's like hey you know because we can't let that stop the good guys. And I'm like, ah, I, I love Marty and Red. Like, this is a real good relationship. But he takes the fireworks out to this this bridge out in the middle of the night and starts setting them off. And then he uses one of the rockets to shoot into the eye of the werewolf. And I'm like, you have a scene where you're using colored fireworks and this looks flat and boring. Like, that yeah. that that kind of stood out to me. It is a bummer when things like that don't really live up to expectations because, you know, seeing the artwork in Cycle of the Werewolf, you're like, okay, you know, Bernie Wrightson might not have the brightest art style out there. <laughs> and, you know, that's something that fits super well for the story mm -hmm. is that sort of darker art tone. And I really loved looking at all of those images throughout the book and then here it's just like oh okay cool that's a thing that happened and you could have made it so much darker at moments too and so oh, much for sure. brighter for some others and they just either didn't have room in the budget to do that or didn't 
think to do that because, you know, maybe it wasn't something that was on the director's mind at the time. Who knows? But yeah, you kind of finish this movie wanting something a little more out of it, but at the same time, still having had a pretty good time. Yeah, that that's what I mean when I say it's only about three or four notches from being like truly it's like, oh, this could be great with just a couple they would be major tweaks, but they're not like so astronomical. You know, but by, by the end of this movie, when we have Red and Jane and Marty in their house and, and the Reverend in, in werewolf alf form is coming to get them, he they end up shooting him in his other eye, which I felt was just like salt in the wound. Um <laughs> so but when he regresses, he's this pale corpse with these, you know, two wounds on his eyes. And I'm like, that's ah, a that's a fun, creepy image. And he does a stereotypical one last jump scare thing. Um, but yeah, I Silver Bullet or rather Cycle of the Werewolf is possibly my number one Stephen King piece of material that I think needs a new version. Like because yeah. it's it's already like so it's like ah, everything's right there. And you could make something really good out of this. Yeah, there are definitely some of his properties that could use a remake. And I know people get tired of remakes and reboots and things like that. But I feel like when you have something that didn't quite land Mm -hmm. when it was made, that is something that to me is a bit of an exception. You know, we don't need a new Jaws by any means. You know, they continued Star Wars. They didn't reboot it. They Mm -hmm. continued it. So I feel like that is something that's a little different because those IPs will live on for seemingly forever at this point. You know, how many people don't know about Star Wars? It's like how many people don't know who Batman is? (laughs) You know, you have these things in pop culture that just sort of stick with you, you know, and Silver Bullet is definitely not one of those things, but if someone remakes it the right way, it could have the same impact that it did when it was remade. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's I think Silver Bullet is kind of a perfect case for this is when you want to do a remake because it's it's not terrible. And the material that it's adapting is is very beloved. And, And I know that Silver Bullet has a cult following because Something I like about this movie and the potential for a greater version of this is it's like it chapter one, the film where its main perspective characters are supposed to be kids. So its audience kind of wants to be younger kids who feel like they're ready to take on some more hard edged horror elements. And I think that's why Silver Bullet does maintain a a small but loyal cult following is because a lot of people saw it when they were young and it made an impact on them because it was like, hey, this is a Stephen King gory werewolf movie that I get to see and it means something to me and and that's awesome. But I do think that, you know, with us in the middle of another Stephen King adaptation renaissance, uh, you know, like we just got Pet Cemetery, and I'm like, you know, I really think Cycle of the Werewolf that or another if you want to call it silver bullet call it silver bullet again i think you could make something with a stronger visual style and a a better representation not just of the the novella but a better representation of the perspective that this story is trying to tell which is land it firmly in the kid's perspective and you know don't don't reveal the reverend as the werewolf until they kind of figure it out. Like, even if it's that, that means reshuffling around some of the plot elements, because we're going to want to see that werewolf dream scene done again. Mm-hmm. I, I really think so. Silver Bullet, it's still one I would say if you're a King devotee that you need to see, especially because he he wrote the screenplay. This is another one of his solo credit screenplay offers. But it is. I if I could if I had unlimited budget and could do any one thing to kind of remake out of this out of the Stephen King uh, filmography, it would be Silver Bullet. You'll just have to write the script yourself and pitch it I to guess people. So. <laughs> yeah, I gotta I gotta pitch it to King. I'm up here, you know, I'm near Maine, so I could just drive up there and, you know, leave it at his doorstep. <laughs> 
I wonder how many people have done that over the years. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I might not be the first. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you that there are certain things that, you know, you would be fine with adapting again. And I'm glad you mentioned Pet Cemetery because that is one that comes out a few years after Silver Bullet, and it's just now getting a remake. And the remake is different. Oh, yes. And, you know, I won't spoil that for anyone, obviously, since it's still a fairly new movie at the time we are recording this. But, you know, sometimes people really like it when you make these changes that benefit being on the big screen. And sometimes people don't. So, you know, I've been seeing very mixed reviews about Pet Cemetery. Personally, oh, yeah. I enjoyed it. You know, me too. And I think it's just one of those hit or miss things. But like you said, we're in another Stephen King adaptation renaissance, you know, which seems to be every decade, pretty much. Yep. <laughs> you know, it comes it's just back like, around. oh, OK, we're, we're going to do this. All right, cool. <laughs> well, I, I think in regards to Pet Cemetery being remade and and then mirroring that with Silver Bullet, the original Pet Cemetery film is is a pretty faithful adaptation of the novel from what I understand like it's it I'm sure it has changes and differences but it's not in comparison to the new movie which makes some very big changes but with the new Pet Cemetery, it feels like well they did a version that was trying to be the the best version of the novel they could do this new remake decides well then we have to make a case for why we're remaking this whereas mm -hmm. Silver Bullet or Cycle of the Werewolf, if you make a new version, I think you can make the argument of the the original film didn't capture the best version of the novel, which yeah. I, I think that's the argument to make for a new version of Silver Bullet is that we want to make the truest version of Cycle of the Werewolf and Silver Bullet, while it's not a bad movie on its own terms, I don't think it's the it's the best version adaptation you could do of cycle of the werewolf yeah totally in agreement there and clearly since we both rated it the same exact thing you yeah. know <laughs> it is very nice to be on the same page with this one because some of these older adaptations you know it's like a lot of people love the shining but king hates it so i'm very interested to see the one that happens in the 90s i believe the tv movie one and just to compare and contrast the differences because King approves of one, but not the other. And obviously he wrote the screenplay for this, so mm -hmm. he had to approve it on some level. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm sure I, I would, it's, it's something I'd love to hear his thoughts on, you know, 30 plus years later uh, to see if that's one that he's like, yeah, I wouldn't mind somebody doing a new version of that. Or if he feels that silver bullet is, the best kind of adaptation that could come from his work. E even if he thinks it is, I would still want a new version of yeah. it. But, <laughs> yeah. but no, I, I I still, like I say, I, I recommend Silver Bullet to people who really want to see uh, some of the, you know, the better King adaptations out there. I, I don't think this one is bad by any means. And clearly, I think, as it's something that I saw when I was a kid, it might be something that if you've got like, younger aged kids who are kind of wanting to get into horror and you think that they're able to handle uh, some violent elements, this might not be a bad one to test out on them. Yeah. And I mean, there were children in Pet Cemetery when I went to see that. So I Ridiculous. think parents are pretty lenient <laughs> on what their kids see these days. I know? would not have brought my kid to that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, okay, that's a that's a parental choice. <laughs> yeah, you you want to you want to feel depressed for the rest of the day, kids? Let's go see Pet Cemetery. <laughs> yeah, well, Drew, it's clear we are going to be starting a remake Silver Bullet petition here. So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming on to talk about the movie. It's Anytime. always a pleasure. Anytime. And to our listeners, you can follow us at Chat Cemetery on Twitter and Instagram. If you subscribe to the podcast, you won't miss a single episode. That would be great. You can find this show in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, most of the normal places where you can get podcasts. It is there. So check it out. Rate and review it if you are enjoying it. And as always, thank you all for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Arr